Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm David Knight. It's Thursday, October 29th, 2015. Here are our top stories. Tonight, Paul Ryan takes over as Speaker of the House. Will the new boss be any different from the old boss? Then, how a runaway blimp is a perfect analogy for U.S. politics. After that, smashing pumpkins to save the earth and highlights from the GOP debate. That's next. They know who you are. They know you hate them. They know you got bad will. We hate you. We see you, Phil. We know you're killing babies. We know you're aborting them. We know you're selling their body parts. You, we know, we know, we know you don't like us. Well, we don't like you either. Got that? You want to fight, you little bastards? You're going to get one! The sleeping giant is rising! Yes! Break the chain! And it's that type of behavior that spurred me to do the research to develop a true nutraceutical formula that was designed to smooth out and help children focus. All of our children are hit with modern mind control. Television, music, fast food, GMOs, sugars, you name it. Young humans have not yet developed their nervous system and are being hammered daily by globalist concoctions. It's no wonder they can't focus and calm down and then are put on dangerous psychotropic drugs. Working with my team, we set out to find the best formula with the highest quality ingredients that children would actually like and take. We worked with the leading manufacturer in nutritional supplements that are safe for children to bring you the most affordable and powerful calming formula out there. Introducing Child Ease with herbs and calming extracts like chamomile and lemon balm and essential nutrients that taste great. Obtain your Child Ease today at InfoWarsLife.com. That's Child Ease exclusively at InfoWarsLife.com. <laughs> Well, it's a new day in Washington in Congress, or is it? John Boehner has left, but it looks like we have a new face that is going to be the same. Meet the new boss, same as the old boss. It's interesting that John Boehner says that what drove him out of office was right-wing talk radio, conservative talk radio. This story from WND, John Boehner says that it was right-leaning talk radio host in particular that led to his political downfall. He says... Understand what was going on here. There were hundreds of radio hosts trying to outright each other, who, when combined with active social media posters, caused unnecessary turmoil and confusion over political and cultural matters. Yeah, you know, he sounds exactly like the SPLC, doesn't he? You know, the problem is, is that we were talking, you were listening, and you were writing and telling other people about it on social media. It wasn't anything that he was doing wrong. It wasn't that he was ignoring the wishes of the GOP voters who'd put him in, that he betrayed them on the issues. No, that had nothing to do with it. It was the people who blew the whistle on him. That's the way it is in Washington all the time, isn't it? Perfect metaphor, as we said last night, and again, as uh, Huckabee pointed out, the blimp, the out-of-control blimp that we saw there. That's the perfect metaphor for our out-of-control government. A $3 billion blimp. How's that for inflation? $3 billion, of course, it's the Pentagon, and they're part of the runaway, out-of-control government. Certainly the military-industrial complex, the surveillance state part of that. This balloon broke its tether. It uh, drug the tether then through power lines, causing over 27,000 customers to lose power. And as this was happening yesterday, we were watching this, it was just like, this is what everybody is looking at in terms of the economy. We've got this massive hyperinflated blimp from Washington that is on the rampage, most of it being uh, justified by defense spending. Everybody is wondering when and where it'll crash and exactly how much damage it's going to do. But don't worry, because yesterday, just as they were getting ready to debate economic issues with the GOP, the GOP House, with John Boehner as his parting shot, decided that they would put even more hot air into the runaway blimp. And so uh, today, Paul Ryan has now become speaker and he pledges to fix the broken house. He's going to fix this runaway blimp of Washington. And you can believe him because, uh, well, not really. He's been on the wrong side of most of the big issues. He's been on the side of open borders. He's been on the side of the big spending part of the Republican, uh, the Republican side. 
Of course, that's one of the reasons why the Democrats love him so much. The House whip said uh, he was a great choice, and so many of the Democrats love him. And of course, he got 83% of the GOP. This isn't something that the Democrats are doing to us. This is going to continue the legacy and the way that it, business is being conducted by Boehner, by Pelosi, and now we have Paul Ryan. Put a different face on it. It really doesn't matter. They are exactly the same on all of the key issues, the secret corporate trade agreements, the open borders, the globalism, the single Washington party, which the leadership of both houses, uh, both, both parties represent, and he is the new face for all that. But this whole deal of extending this debt ceiling for another couple of years was an effort to put a new mask in, a new face, and to give him an extended honeymoon. And he's trying to pretend that he doesn't want to have anything to do with it. This story from CNN, Paul Ryan O, and that's what we need to start calling him, Paul Ryan O, doesn't want anyone to pin the budget deal on him. He says, about the process, I can say this. I think the process stinks. He's running against Washington while he's in Washington, while he's part of the leadership. He says, this is not the way to do the people's business. No, this is the way you do the corporation's business. And that's what he's been doing. He says, under new management, we're not going to do the people's business this way. He criticized outgoing Speaker John Boehner for cutting this deal with Obama and the Democrat leadership behind closed doors. And yet he supported precisely that for the corporations that he works for when it came to the fast track trade agreement. This is just doublespeak. But just how big is this national debt, of course? Remember that in 2011, John Boehner reached this sequester agreement with Obama. At that time, the, the debt, the, uh, the cumulative debt was $14 trillion. Now it is $18 trillion four years later, and they've just extended it to $20 trillion. So how big is the national debt? We have this article on Infowars.com from Steve Watson. He points out that it is as big as 120,000 Floyd Mayweather fights. The Daily Signal decided to put together some statistics to illustrate just how much of a problem the spiraling black hole of debt is. They note that Floyd Mayweather, the highest paid athlete on the planet, earned around $300 million in 2015 from an average of two fights per year. So he would have to uh, fight 120,000 fights. Take a look at Taylor Swift, for example. Okay, she's made $80 million doing uh, in one year from 55 concerts. So they look at this and they say, well, in order to pay off just one day's worth of interest on this debt, and where does that interest go? It goes to the Federal Reserve and their, uh, their, the people that they sell the debt to. Taylor Swift would have to perform every day for three years at the kind of money that she's making. See, you really can't get your head around this. These are astronomical figures. Remember Everett Dirksen back in the 50s or 60s saying, you know, a, a billion here, a billion there. Pretty soon you're talking about real money. We cannot comprehend just how big it is. But we, I can tell you that in just four years, Boehner working with Obama and the Democrat leadership has extended the debt ceiling by 43%. Maybe you can understand that. Now, Rand Paul has said he's going to filibuster this, but Time Magazine points out why this will fail. Of course, it's going to fail because he's being opposed by the GOP leadership. They say he can thank his fellow Kentuckian, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. They say on Thursday afternoon, Senator Rand Paul took the floor of the Senate. He began speaking for what could be more than eight hours. The Kentucky senator earlier had vowed that he would do everything he could to stop the two-year-old debt ceiling, the two-year debt ceiling raise, and the budget agreement passed yesterday, pa actually passed on Tuesday, 266 to 167. He says, it's hard for me not to use profanity when describing it. He said that after the debate last night. He said, we should be using the leverage of the debt ceiling to actually enforce spending restraint. Exactly. That's what they haven't done every time they've raised the debt ceiling. They don't use it as any leverage to affect any restraining on spending. He says the deal also will add $56 billion in additional spending to both fiscal years. So you understand that. Okay, the debt is the cumulative deficits. But of course, we're going to go into debt at a faster rate because they're not only are they not using anything to leverage down the spending, they're actually going to increase the spending. So what's going to happen? Well, According to Senate rules, Rand Paul can keep talking until midnight, as long as he doesn't sit down or take a bathroom break, at which time the debate will expire. And they say that's when things get interesting, because his fellow senator from Kentucky, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, will then move to vote on cloture, a Senate procedure that limits the debate of a bill to 30 hours, essentially stopping the filibuster.
This is the way that it will end. The leadership of the GOP has worked hand in glove with the Democrat leadership to do anything that the two of them want to do, anything their corporate masters tell them to do. Well, of course, we had the econ economic debate last night with the GOP leadership, and I thought it was interesting because today, and I want to wish him a happy anniversary, this is Ben Carson's first one-year anniversary of being a Republican. He registered one year ago today, became a Republican, and here he is. In less than a year, he had three GOP debates as a presidential candidate. That's great. You know, I really don't care whether he's in the GOP party or not. I really don't care about partisan politics. What I do care about is if he knows about the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, things like that. And I look forward to celebrating the one-year anniversary when Ben Carson reads the Bill of Rights, reads the Constitution, reads the Nuremberg Code, understands why we have moral, ethical codes that prohibit people from demanding that you take things like vaccines against your informed consent, that you could read the Constitution, understand why we had to have a constitutional amendment for prohibition. That's the anniversary I'm looking forward to celebrating. But of course, uh, CNBC is celebrating. They got 14 million viewers. That's far fewer than have been at the other debates, but it is still huge audience for CNBC. And how did they run this debate? Well, of course, we've heard a lot of comments. Everybody is talking about how awful that was. We uh, covered it live last night. You, we're going to have some clips of that coming up here on the Nightly News, some highlights uh, from that debate. And certainly uh, it was poorly managed by CNBC. Look at, for one thing, look at the way uh, the time broke down. This is New York Times calculations of who got how much time. I was surprised to see that Kasich wasn't the person who got the most amount of time. Actually, he got about eight minutes and 42 seconds. Carly Fiorina got the most, 10 and a half minutes. And I think that we need to start referring to her not as the former HP CEO, but as the fired HP CEO. It's amazing to me that somebody would use the fact that they got fired as a CEO and that they failed as a Senate candidate. That's her big resume ticket items. After Fiorina, there was Rubio, Trump, then Kasich. Carson, who had just taken a lead, national lead in the polls, was next to the last in terms of the amount of time that he got to talk. Only seven minutes, and of course, Jeb Bush was the very last one on that totem pole. But what did they talk about? Well, they talked about the economy, supposedly, but not really. They, there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of personal attacks that they tried to instigate, and a lot of personal attacks from the moderators themselves debating the candidates. But one of the things I think that really got me concerned about this, made me uh, angry about this debate, besides the fact that they talked about a lot of non-substantive issues, was the fact that when they finally did talk about the economy, no Republican candidate, and I mean no Republican candidate, including Rand Paul, offered any substantive reforms for controlling this out-of-control blimp that we call the federal government. Nobody offered anything. As a matter of fact, they couldn't think of a single thing to cut except for Social Security. Isn't that pathetic? Isn't that pathetic? And Rand Paul was one of the worst in that. I love Rand Paul when it comes to civil liberties. But on defense spending, on his policy with Israel, and on this, he is absolutely wrong. Look at this. Rand Paul exaggerates the effects of raising the age of eligibility for Medicare. And, of course, they crunched the numbers. And they said, well, if he was to raise it from 65 to 67, it would only save $19 billion over 10 years. That's not really the point. The point is, is this the only thing a libertarian candidate can come up with? I remember when a real libertarian candidate, Harry Brown, ran for president. And he went back and he said, look at the income tax. Do you think you could, how about let's just talk about getting rid of the IRS. Let's not talk about different income levels, different tax rates. Let's just get rid of it. Oh, that's not realistic, they say. Look at how much it contributes to the overall budget. As a matter of fact, there's a large chunk of the budget that we don't pay for each year. That's called the deficit but in addition to that, if you just look at the personal income tax aspect of it, in 2014, the personal income tax only contributed 36%.